Good evening. Tonight's topic will be about the spirit of sonship. We will relate to it because uh, sonship, according to the kingdom, in the kingdom of God, is not about um, having a name to ourselves, but rather it is the working of the Holy Spirit that makes us sons of God. And it should be an experience, not just a, a matter of declaration. So we would like to start, please. We are now in the third session of the courts of heaven where righteousness and justice is the atmosphere of heaven. It's the spirit of sonship. Our destiny is to be his son, according to Romans chapter 8, that God foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. We all are supposed to be like his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So that's us, a brother to his son. Now, this is not about being male or female when we talk about son. It's more about our relationship with our father in our position as heir of the father or co-heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are sons and we know it. It is written in his word and God sees it that way. The question is, do I feel like a son? Do I think like a son? And do I act like the son of God? Do I experience this personal relationship with the Heavenly Father? It is a relationship, of course. Now, do I live out this relationship in my daily life? And if not, why? Why not? If I am fully embracing everything what God says, okay, and what God thinks about me, then what is preventing me from having that experience? Something must be wrong. We need to do something. We are meant to be sons and not orphans. You know, the time of Adam and Eve there at paradise, when they fell, when they committed sin, they were ejected, they were evicted, expelled from the garden, and thus they became spiritual orphans. They no longer had the fatherhood of God over them. Romans 5 tells us that. Uh, Sin came in by one man, and death also came by sin. And so death was passed on to all mankind, and that all have sinned now, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So because Adam and Eve sinned, okay, slavery is our heritage. All of us have sinned in our life because of the sin of Adam and Eve. And this affects how we feel. It affects how we think about ourselves. It affects how we feel and think about God. We are all spiritual orphans as we are separated from the Lord. So that's why Jesus came to pay the penalty of sin, that we may be uh, redeemed. And so because we have Jesus in our life today, we are on a journey from Orphanness to sonship. Do you know that orphans have a spirit of poverty or poverty spirit? Even though a person may be so rich, but if there is a poverty spirit, you will feel that they, ha they need more, they need more, they need more. And there is a fear, fear of the unknown, fear of losing their wealth, fear of so many kinds of fear. And also there is no identity. Because there is no relationship to the Father. They are orphans. Sonship, however, it brings faith to believe and to agree with the Father. And there is a sense of identity because there is sonship. And there, the resources of the kingdom are available as we have a responsibility to do in the kingdom. Now, God is Father. It is His nature. And the Bible says He is love. And when he said in John 14, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you, he really meant it. 
He does not want us to be orphans. He wants us to be sons. So let's look at the roots of spiritual orphans. Okay? It all started with Satan in Isaiah 14. He, he, it speaks of his five ambitions of sin. First is, he said, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. I will displace God the Father, and I will be the highest being in the universe. This five I wills of Satan was the very cause why he was rejected and evicted from heaven. He wanted, and he decided they didn't want God as his father. He wanted to be an orphan, no fatherhood over, over him. So he became the first and the ultimate spiritual orphan. Wow. This is what the Lord God says. He told, uh, he spoke to uh, Lucifer regarding, uh, regarding his spiritual condition. You served as my model, my example, my complete vision and perfect beauty. Oh, Lucifer was very beautiful, the most beautiful angel in heaven. You used to be in Eden, okay? That's where Adam and Eve were, were, were created and placed. God's paradise. You wore precious stones for clothing, ruby, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and carbuncle. Your settings were crafted in gold. Wow. Along with your engravings, on the day of your creation, they had been prepared. So, Lucifer is a created being. You were the anointed cherub. He was set apart. Having been set in the place on the holy mountain of God, you walked in the midst of fiery stones. You were blameless in your behavior from the day you were created. He was just perfect. Until wickedness was discovered in you. When he had a, a five I wills. Since your vast business dealings filled you with violent intent from top to bottom, you sinned, okay? Satan sinned. Lucifer sinned. So I cast you away as defiled from the mountain of God. He was banned from the mount of God. I destroyed you, you guardian cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart grew arrogant. Because of your beauty, you annihilated your own wisdom because of your splendor. Then I threw you to the ground in the presence of kings, giving them a good look at you. Wow. By all of your iniquity and unrighteous businesses, you defiled your sanctuaries. So I'm going to bring out the fire from within you and burn you to ashes on the earth before the whole world, behold, before the whole what before the whole watching world. Everyone who knows you throughout all the nations will be appalled at your calamity, and you will no longer exist forever. Wow. So Satan's ambition was to displace God. He wanted to be father, he wanted to be God, he wanted to replace God. Okay, Satan therefore was cast out of heaven. Now, what did he miss when he was cast out of heaven? Okay, he missed the Father's presence. Father was always in heaven, his presence was there, his manifest presence that is. Heaven is where we find the love of God, we enjoy the love of God. The atmosphere of heaven is the love of the Father. When you're in heaven, you are surrounded, you are breathing in love, and love is touching you. Everything about heaven is love. So from an eternity of joy and glory in heaven, 
He was removed. He was cast out. He was evicted. He was cast into an eternity of hell and suffering. Wow. So Satan was cast out of the Father's love. He was cast out from the fathering of God. He became a spiritual orphan. So Adam and Eve, when they were evicted from the Garden of Eden, they suffered the greatest broken heart. Wow. Because in the garden, when everything was right between them and God, they enjoyed perfect love. But now, they were cast away out from paradise. They were, they were forced out. They walked out into fear. There was a known. They had to struggle because man was told he cannot eat by unless through the uh, through the uh, he cannot eat unless through the sweat by his brow, and he had pain because death has come in into the world. There was now sickness and disease. Okay. And there was emptiness because the place where God used to fill up was, no, was already vacuumed. There was emptiness in their heart and in their lives. They were walking out of the Father's love and they, be, they were fatherless. They were orphans. As they walked out, they had an unholy alliance between them and the Spirit the ultimate orphan spirit who is satan satan is the god of this age he is controlling this world and he is manipulating people as people are walking in this life in the book of ephesians it talks about the unholy alliance of man and be between man and between satan it says here in verse one and you were dead in the trespasses and sins which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So all of mankind, children of wrath. Oh, wow. So we are living in an orphan world. We are all orphans. So when we were in Adam and Eve, when they walked out of the Garden of Eden, we also are in the same shoes. And through the generations, we all walk in the ways of an orphan. We'll talk later on the difference between a son and an orphan. Now we fight for everything. We do it. Yours, do it yourself. You're looking after yourself and get what you get when you can get it. That's how an orphan survives. So God the Father knows the future of man. Okay. He has the future in his, in his sight. He knows what's going to happen. He all knows about, he all, he knows about the orphan life about the pain and the suffering that man has to go through, about the war, starvation, the broken marriages, the poverty, and even the pestilence, and etc., etc. How do you think God the Father felt as he watches his children, his sons and daughters, go through the orphan life, suffering pain, and how going through war, starvation, broken marriages, poverty, etc., etc. How did the father feel when man is suffering so much? So God, because he felt for man, he loved man, he loves us. He sent representation. He sent prophets, kings, poets, men of God. But no one could really represent who the father was. Okay, until Jesus came. When Jesus came, he only did and said what the Father was doing and saying. So he represented the Father totally. Okay. In John chapter 5, talks about Jesus. I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing. Because 
whatever the father does, the son also does. Okay? So, for I did not speak on my own accord, that's Jesus speaking, but the father who sent me told me what to say and how to say it. Wow. So, what is the heart of sonship? We read in Galatians 4, When the fullness of time had come, okay, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. What, what, what for? To redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Wow. So, when we were born again, we became sons and daughters of God by adoption. However, God goes further than just adoption, just than making us just part of his family. He went further than that. Adoption is just the first step. Okay? Galatians 4, because you are his sons, okay? God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Okay? Not just being called to be his son, but he sent his spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. Okay. Because you are sons, you're God's son by legal right. Okay. We are his son. First, by virtue of creation. Secondly, by virtue of redemption. He created us and we got lost into the darkness in this world because of sin. And we were redeemed. We were bought back by the blood of Jesus. So legally, we are His. And He has poured out His Spirit of His Son upon us. The word adoption in the Greek word is eutesia. And it means to place as a son. It's not, it's not just uh, declaring that we are a son. It's placing as a son, meaning giving uh, responsibilities so that we can do business in behalf of the Father. We can sign um, contracts in behalf of the Father. We can do things in behalf of the Father. That is how we are placed as a son, adoption, eutesia. In a word, you use it's the common noun for an adult. Jesus was credited as his son, when he was 30 years old, when he was baptized in, uh, by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, the Spirit of God came as a dove, and God said, this is my beloved son whom I love. Okay, so he was placed as a son at the age of 30 when he was baptized. Okay, come on for an adult son. And the word tesia is means placement or an installation, a setting of a person or thing in its place. So not just adoption, bringing into the family, but setting into place of responsibility of sonship. Sonship is actually a responsibility. It's not just a position. Romans 8, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, cry out, Abba, Father. You know, the adopted child cannot by in his own strength cry out, Abba, Father, or nor our human hearts, our carnal hearts. We don't cry out, Abba, Father. It's only through the spirit of the Son in us that we are able to call Abba, Father, because the spirit of God in us affirms and confirms that we are his Son. So when we close our hearts to our Father, we lost the heart of a son. Let me tell you a story. James Jordan one of the ministers of the Father Heart Ministry wrote in his book that when he was studying how to pray, you see, he saw a, a lady who was also there in New Zealand. Uh, right, no, it's, it was in America. 
This lady, when James Jordan looked at her, James Jordan just knew that she knew how to pray. There were, James Jordan met so many intercessors, prayer warriors, but when he looked at this lady, he just knew that this lady knew how to pray. So he wanted to practice praying, to be just like this lady, to know how to pray. So in a chapel, small chapel, he prayed every morning at six. He started at six o'clock. And when he looked at his watch, when he stopped, it was only 6.10. He only prayed 10 minutes, but it seemed that it was like an eternity that he was praying. Until that he continued to practice praying. He did it over and over again. That he began to pray for hours. And he said in his book, one day the Lord Jesus came. And in that very chapel, Jesus asked him, who is your father? You know, Jim Jordan was tongue-tied. The first thing that he thought he was about to say, the name of his biological father. But something behind his mind told him, he is not your father. You were never a son to him. You see, they were living in one roof. They ate in one dining table. They saw each other every morning. And sometimes James Jordan did chores for his father. But because his father was abusive, his father was performance oriented. His father was not fair between him and his brother. Somehow in their relationship, James Jordan closed his heart to his father. That's why the Lord Jesus asked him, who is your father? And the Lord Jesus asked him again, who is your father? The James Jordan thought about his pastor. But then from the back of his head, there was a, a voice saying, he's not your father. You were never a son to him. So he thought again about his uncle, who was also a good man, who was generous and who was so godly, involved in many ministry. But then somewhere in the back of his head, it said, he's also not your father. And you know what? He was learning something about sonship because he closed his heart to his father. He lost the heart of a son. He was an orphan. Wow. Now we all have biological fathers. Some of our fathers, we, we know our fathers are not perfect. And what our fathers did not receive from their parents, they cannot give it unto us. That's why we have to forgive them. Because they did not know what they were doing. They were just um, extending what they have. But they don't have anything. They don't have fathering in them. They don't have the sonship in them. That's why they fail as a father. That's why some of them are absentee father. They're in the house, but they're, they aren't there. Some of them are passive. They are not involved with you. Some of them are performance oriented. They don't care for you unless you uh, achieve something. And some of them are abusive. They abuse their fatherhood. That's why many children, and in fact, many ministers, as from our experience and what we have observed through their testimonies, many have closer hearts to the father. And they have lost the heart of a the heart of a son. That's why, in this uh, lesson about courts of heaven, it is important to know what the son what sonship is all about, that we may receive the spirit of sonship. Because you know why, a servant cannot just come and go in the father's house, but a son can come and go. If you wanted to go to the courts of heaven, being a son would be an easy thing for us to go to the courts of heaven. That is the idea why we need to understand about sonship. So when the Holy Spirit was poured into us, and if there is no sonship to our biological father, there is no corresponding heart of sonship, then how can we receive the spirit of sonship? Okay, 
when we close our heart as a son, and the Holy Spirit has filled us, of course, we are filled, we are, we are baptized in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit was unable to bring forth sonship within us. Yes, we are Spirit-filled, we are baptized in the Spirit, but if we have closed our heart as a son, the Holy Spirit who is looking for material to use as so that he can release a sonship uh, atmosphere, a dimension in us, when he was looking for that heart, it was not, the heart was not open to sonship. So Jesus experienced this when the Holy Spirit descended upon him at his baptism. Okay? When he was baptized at the Jordan by John the Baptist, God's voice came down from heaven. Said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the spirit of God, the spirit of sonship, came down as a dove and fell or descended upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It is also the same spirit that fell on Jesus, that the same spirit that creates sonship in us. Okay, now, I would like you to just uh, look back for a while in your relationship with your earthly father, biological father, and especially those who did not have any father at all, whose parents, died, whose father died early, or who was left and abandoned by the father. You know what? Let the Holy Spirit find a sonship material in you and you have to be a son to your biological father and how do you do that you confess and repent because they did not know what they were doing they cannot they were victims in the first place just as well as we are they cannot help themselves because they were also victims so we cannot hold them responsible reach out to them if they are still alive or if they're still they're already dead we can still make up for it by releasing forgiveness you see if we don't release forgiveness we are still bound to that dimension and the holy spirit cannot find that material that sonship material that he can use to to bring forth a spirit of sonship within us many christians have known the holy spirit as a spirit of adoption yes we become sons of god but have not yet experienced him as a spirit of sonship okay we know we read we study we meditate about the spirit of adoption but we have to experience him as a spirit of sonship so we can only be filled with the whole spirit we can be filled with the whole spirit and have no life of sonship at all that is a tragedy. That is what we want to remedy even tonight because we do not want any stone to be left un, un, unturned. We look every, uh, every, under every stone and look if there is something wrong, we deal with it. Tonight, if anyone among us do not have a spirit of sonship, we are spirit filled, but we have not experienced the Holy Spirit as a spirit of sonship. This is the time. This is your appointed time to deal with it. Confess, repent, and be restored to your earthly father. May the Holy Spirit find a sp um, spirit of uh, sonship material within us. So when the spirit gets poured into the heart of a person who has no heart of sonship to their own parents, the Holy Spirit cannot function in that person as the spirit of a son. Tragedy. So when we close our heart to our earthly father, we lost the heart of a son. It's something very serious, church. Something we should not let by, uh, bypass us tonight. Something that we really have to deal. It's between you and God. Okay, Between you and God. Perhaps some, some time tonight, you have to come to God and address that circumstance or that situation. We no longer had the heart of a son towards any father figures, including God. So our relationship with God the Father is only 
theological or intellectual or bookish. If we don't have the heart of a son towards any father, we cannot relate to our heavenly father as a son. It's only theological. It's only theory. It's only professional, but no relationship. We have to deal with this. Amen? So the Spirit of God looks for a corresponding harmony within us for it to be made real in our life experience. Because our life is not just memory verse. Our life should be an experience of God. We can see here in the table a category on the left side, on the left uh, side. In the middle column, we see the heart of a slave or a servant or orphan. In the right side of this table, we read the heart of a son. Okay? We'll go through, we'll just breeze through this, and I believe you're going to get a copy of this, uh, of this PowerPoint. So we'll just breeze through this. The orphan sees God as a master, but the son sees God as a loving father. Okay. The orphan is independent, self-reliant, doing it his own way. But the heart of a son is interdependent to the father. He acknowledges need. He is humble enough to ask, God, I really need you. The orphan lived by the love of the law. He loves the law. But the son lived by the law of love. You see, 1 Corinthians 13, if you don't have love, you are just a clanging symbol. If you don't have love, you are nothing, according to God. If you don't have love, you gain nothing. Oh, so an orphan is insecure because nobody's taking care of him. He lacks peace because there is always something to think about. But a, a son always have rest and peace because the father is there to take care of his needs. The orphan strive for the praise, approval, and acceptance of man. Okay, but the son is totally accepted in God's love and is justified by grace. He doesn't have to prove anything. The orphan needs a personal achievement. He needs to achieve something to impress God and the people around him. Or he may have no motivation at all to serve. But the son, the service that he does is motivated because of a deep gratitude of being unconditionally loved and accepted by God. The orphan behind his Christian discipline is all about duty and earning the God's favor, or there is no motivation at all. So he goes to the prayer meeting, he does ministry to earn God's favor. But the son, he does ministry because it is his pleasure and it is a delight for him. Okay? And the orphan, his motive for purity, he must be holy to receive God's favor. And so because he needs to work it out, his holiness, to receive God's favor, there is an increasing shame and guilt. But the son, he doesn't to work for it. He wants to be holy. He desires to be holy. And he doesn't do anything to hinder the intimate relationship with God. He, he just wants to be holy because he wants to be more intimate with God. Not, not to get God's favor, but to be more intimate with God. The, son, the orphan has self-rejection when he compares himself to others. The others are better. The other person has much more things. The other person has much more money. But the son is always positive and affirmed because he knows he has such value to God. God values him. He is the apple of the God's eye. He knows it and feels it. Okay. The orphan seeks comfort in counterfeit affections, like the addictions, compulsions, escapism, the busyness. You know, people can be so busy in ministry because they are looking for a sense of comfort. They think that God accepts them because they are so busy in ministry and they're hyper religious. They're very religious. But you know, the son. He seeks times of quietness and solitude. Doesn't really have to be busy. 
is to be just in rest in the Father's presence and love. Wow. The orphan is always competing. He is always, always has rivalry and jealousy to others who are more successful and those in a higher position. But the son is always humble and he has unity and he values others and he is able to rejoice when others are blessed, when others succeed. He does not envy, he's not jealous. The orphan, the accusation exposure in order to make yourself good. He accuses people. He exposes people in order to make himself good and others make bad, make others to look bad, bad. But the son, because of his love, it covers all the sin, all the faults of others. And he wants to restore others in the spirit of love and gentleness. Wow, something powerful. The orphan sees authority as a source of pain. That authority is there to punish. Authority is there to, to correct. He is distrustful towards them and lacks a hard attitude of submission. He only does things because he is told to, but he, there is no submission. He, he does something, but in his heart, he is against it. The son, however, is always respectful. It, he always honors. And you see them as ministers of God for the good of people around them. The orphan sense of God's presence is always conditional and distant. It depends. It depends on his circumstance. It depends on his, uh, on his situation. But the son is always close and intimate to the Lord. The orphan has difficulty of receiving correction. He must be, he, you must be right. So, so you, get, you easily get your feelings hurt because you think he's always right. And he's close to, close to discipline, doesn't accept discipline. The son, however, receives admonition, receives discipline as a blessing. And it is a need for him so that his faults and weakness are exposed and are put to death. The orphan's condition is enslaved. He is in bondage. But the son, he is free. He has liberty. So the orphan is guarded and conditional as he expresses love. It is based on others' performance as you get to seek your own needs, your, your own needs met. So it's conditional. If they are blessing to you, then you love them. That's an orphan. But the heart of a son, he's open, patient, affectionate as you lay your life and agendas down in order that you as a son will meet the needs of others. Your life is not for your own. You live for others. So the position of, a four, four, of an orphan, he feels like a servant, a slave. Okay? But the son, he feels like a son. He feels like a daughter. He feels loved. The orphan has no choice, but the son, he has free will. So the heart of an orphan, there is spiritual ambition. He has desire for spiritual achievement so that he will be known, he will be recognized, and he will strive to achieve it. There is a desire to be seen and counted among the mature. He wants to look mature. That's why he works for it. He goes the extra mile for it. And people think it's so, this man is so spiritual. He does ministry. He's always involved in ministry. He's in ministry 16 hours a day. But the son, to daily experience the unconditional love and acceptance, then be sent as a representative of love to the father and others. It's just to experience the father's love. He looks forward to receive the father's love. The heart of a son, he fights for what you can get. And the son, it releases your inheritance. Because you're a son, you, you will receive your inheritance. But an orphan he has to fight for it. He has to fight for a blessing. He has to work for a blessing. But a son, because he's a son, he will just receive what he needs. Wow. So the heart of an orphan, he runs from pain. The son embraces pain strategically. 
Orphan seeks to avoid problems. The son seeks opportunities in problems. The orphan sees the cause of failure. The son sees the benefit of failure. Failures are also good because they will, we learn from our failures. The orphan obeys orders. The son solves problems. The orphan looks at the right, at the right way to do a job. The son looks for a better way to do a job. The orphan consider consequences. The son sees possibilities. Wow. The orphan sees cost, but the son sees value. The orphan wants to receive. The son wants to know how they got there. The orphan cares for himself. The son understands social responsibility. What can he do for the people? The orphan talks about self while the son talks about his team. Talks about us, not me. The orphan expects more from others than from self, but the son personally raises the bar. Okay? As orphan extends honor, but the son extends honor downward. Okay. So the son only the orphan only gives honor to those who are above him. But the son gives honor to those even who are down below him. The orphan looks for immediate gain, but the son sows into the future. He looks forward to the fruit in the future. The orphan seeks comfort, while the son seeks fulfillment. Not comfort, but fulfillment. The orphan wants to be like now, but the son will let history be his judge. So just look at this, what, what can people say in the long run? The orphan is disloyal when he succeeds. He will get all the credit for himself, but the son, he initiates sharing the success. The orphan gives favors, but the son shows favor. Okay. The orphan seeks supernatural for self, but the son uses the supernatural in behalf of others. Wow. So. Knowing Jesus is not the same as knowing the Father because the Father is usually only in the background when you compare him to the person of Jesus. We think that if we know Jesus and have experienced him, we will automatically know the Father, but we will see that it's not the, that we, that is not the same way. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Wow. But we need to remember that Jesus is not the Father, and the Father is not Jesus. Jesus was not saying, I am the Father. He never said that knowing him was the same as knowing the Father. He never said that. He said that the Father was in him doing the works. Wow. He said, I only do what I see my Father doing. But he never said, I am the Father. Jesus came to bring us to God the Father. That was the whole point of his coming. Why Jesus came? To bring us to God the Father. To lead us. To usher us. Is the way that he way that truth and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So in John 14. He's talking here about going to the Father. Let, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. For that where I am, there you may also be. Wow. Remember this verse. For that where I am, there you may also be. He was really saying that he was going to prepare a place for them in the Father's heart. Wow. He did not say, you'll be where I will be. No, he didn't say that. But he said, you'll be where I am. Wow. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the way to the destination, and the destination, of course, is our Heavenly Father. Wow. Not just go to heaven, but go to the Father. And by the way, even while we are still in this life, 
even while we still are living in this world, we can go and have intimacy with the Father. Wow. Many Christians believe there is no separate experience of the Father other than your contact with Jesus. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and that will be sufficient for us. Jesus replied, Have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but my Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. He was telling Philip, that the miracles were actually signs of the Father's presence. In verse 7, he said, If you really know me, you would have known the Father also. Wow. Because Jesus came to reveal the Father. In other words, you can know me, you can really know me, and if you really knew me, you would see the Father as well. Can you just imagine that? If you get to know Jesus, you also really get to know the Father because the Father is working in and through Jesus. The truth is that you can have a relationship with Jesus and yet not see the Father at all. Many people go to church and they are able to relate to Jesus, but they are unable to relate to the Father. All things have been delivered to me by my father and no one knows the son except the father nor does anyone know the father except the son wow they intimately intimately know each other and the one to whom the son wills to reveal him he was actually saying the whole jewish race the whole uh, israel nation and those who have learned all about him do not actually know him but Jesus does. Because people only were able to relate to Jesus and not to the Father. They were short. They stopped at Jesus and didn't proceed going to the Father. What he meant was, I know the Father by personal connection, and no one knows him like I do, but I can reveal him to you. Church, do you want the Father to be revealed to you tonight? I can reveal the Father to those whom I choose to reveal Him. Wow, that's very powerful. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Okay? Remember this, this passage. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from Jesus as we take the yoke upon, himself, upon ourselves. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Wow. What yoke is Jesus in? What yoke was is he talking about? You see, a yoke will bind together. As this yoke upon the bull, they are yoked together. One cannot go the other way, and one cannot go another way. They have to go together. So when we are yoked with Jesus, we go with him. We don't go on our own way. We do what he says. When Jesus was yoked to the Father, he did not do anything unless he saw the Father. He didn't say anything unless he heard from the Father because he was yoked to the Father. Jesus is the bond. He's the bond in a love yoke with the Father. So to be yoked with the Father, Jesus will be the one leading us, uh, uh, bringing us to this love yoke, to be yoked in love with the Father. It means come in to this love yoke with the Father, like I am, like he was. Jesus was love yoke or yoke in love with his Father. So he said, come and learn from me how I, I, I am yoked with love to my Father. Learn from me. Because we are in Christ, 
we can learn from him and we can be brought to the father to be yoked in love to the father now we don't walk with jesus in galatians 2 i have been crucified with christ it is no longer i who live but christ who lives in me wow we don't walk with christ he lives in us and the life i now live in the flesh i live by faith in the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me our life has been swallowed by christ we are in him he is in us our life now is christ living in us now that you are in christ enter to this love you okay be yoked with him be yoked with the father and walk with him in this yoke okay the work that he is doing walk with him because we are yoked with him christianity is actually resting in the arms of love of the father as we are yoked in love with him one step with the father will accomplish more than a thousand steps of an enthusiastic action so we can do things we can be very busy can be involved in this and we can go with that we'll have endeavors you can be participating so many things at the same time but just one step with the father it will accomplish so much when we are yoked with him when we are in rest with him jesus says my burden is light okay c.s lewis who is a well-known author and a, a lay uh, theologian he said one thing christians have and the world doesn't have and no other religion has is joy you see you will not experience that joy unless there is a rest in your heart and you will have no rest in your heart unless you are yoked in love with the father because if you're not yoked with the father you'll be doing things you'll be very busy you'll be doing this and that and going there and here but when the father yoked with him something powerful transpires so this is what christianity is we have been restless for years we've been so busy we're involved in so many ministry we've been attending so many seminars and conferences trying to to learn more trying to do things better and not knowing what we are actually looking for we go through seminars and conferences hopefully to learn something but we didn't know what we were looking for knowing the father is not just a matter of adhering to a theology in the book or the study of god in a book reading from it and trying to appreciate something about the study of god in a book no the father himself becomes real to your spirit it's not just reading from a study of god in a book but it will be a real experience in your spirit and his love became begins to be be revealed within you not just read about it not just hear about it not just being preached about it but his love is going to be revealed and folded you will experience that love so the whole point of christianity is to know the father and to know him not because you've read about it about him in a book somewhere or in a bible you will get to know him because he will reveal himself jesus came to reveal the father the bible is there so that the father will be revealed it's not about the reading it's not about knowledge it's more about the revelation of the father that is important jesus is the way to the father the revealing of the father is the destination just don't just uh, pursue ministry pursue getting a revelation of the father get an intimacy with the father the truth is you really cannot know the father unless you have the heart of a son or a daughter you cannot know him because he is father and only the son will know the father not a slave not a servant but a son will know the father 
you can receive a touch from God, the Father, okay, in a revival service, on a prayer meeting, you can receive a touch from Him. When you are being prayed for, you can receive a touch from Him. You can have an experience of His love poured out unto you. So powerful and so warm. Yes, you can even know His love touching your heart. And it is uh, rearranging and, and, re and, 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 and even exciting your emotions. But you cannot have an intimate relationship with the Father unless you have the heart of a son. So important to have the spirit of sonship. Many people encounter the Heavenly Father, but only those who have the heart of a son or the heart of a daughter can live in relationship with him as a father. As you come to know him as your father, and his love begins to touch and fill your heart, that same love over time will be the one to continuously heal your heart. Wow. There will be an ongoing progressive healing of your heart as you get to know the Father, and his love will minister and touch you and fill your heart over and over and over again. If you don't have the heart of a son to the parents that God gave you, now remember your parents, they are not perfect, but in their own way they love you, although it may not show, although they may be abusive, although they may be absent or passive, but you cannot have a real relationship with God as your father if you don't have a heart of a son to your parents. And you will go through your life, throughout your life, unless this dealt with, you will go throughout your life trapped in your orphan ways and perspectives, according to what we have gone through in the table regarding uh, uh, an orphan and a son. Malachi 4, 6. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree, decree of utter destruction. Wow. There will be a curse. If we are not restored to the Father as a son. Why? Because that is God's will for us. That we will have the heart or the spirit of sonship. Next, if you are in some form of Christian ministry, whatever ministry may be, pulpit ministry or healing ministry or evangelistic ministry or prophetic ministry, whatever ministry it may be, you will never, you will always face a limit. There will always be a barrier in how you will be effective. Yes, you can still do the ministry, but you will, you will not be as effective as you can be because to be like Jesus, you have to have a heart of a son. You minister, you minister like Jesus. But if you don't have a heart of a son, you will be limited. You will be constrained. You will not go to the summit of your capacity or your potential. And that is not good. You are not exercising the totality of your potential unless you have the heart of a son. If you don't have the heart of a son, your capacity to speak and to act like Jesus from your heart is only limited. Yes, we have scripture. We do ministry. We do what the word of God is saying. But it's really limited if we don't have the heart of a son or the spirit of sonship. Romans 8, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. Wow. And by him, through the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. 
we can only cry, Abba, Father, if the spirit of sonship is within us. God, the Father, hears it when it is the spirit of sonship calling him Abba, Father. But in our own hearts, in our own strength, capacity, when we cry out, Abba, Father, it will not mean anything to God. It has to be by his spirit. And remember, it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by the spirit, says the Lord. So the spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We know that we know that we know that we know, not intellectually, but we know it because the Holy Spirit confirms it. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. We have something to look forward to. We have a birthright. If we indeed share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. What does God want for you? Well, God desires that you would connect with him with your emotions, not just intellectually, but with your emotions. When you connect with God through your emotions, it, is, it reflects an open heart, that your heart is not closed. It's not close to your father, it's close to your parents, but it's open. Psalm 51, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and uncontrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. You know, talking about broken and being contrite. Have you ever seen those wild stallions being domesticated? The wild stallions, you cannot ride on them. When you try to ride on them, the stallion will throw you out off from its back because they are not broken. So the cowboys will have to ride the stallions over and over again until the stallions are domesticated. They are broken and the cowboys can ride them and the stallions will go anywhere that the cowboy would want them to go. So if we don't have a broken and contrite spirit, we will not go where God wants us to go. We will not say what God wants us to say. We will not do what God wants us to do. That's why God wants a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. God will not despise. Psalm 51, 11, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Wow, we need the spirit of sonship. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. It's not by might, not by power, but by his spirit, says the Lord. The flesh amounts to nothing, but it's the spirit that brings life. So that is what God wants for us. Being sensitive to the Holy Spirit is the key to connect your emotions and your heart to your loving Father. So if you want to connect your emotions, how you feel, how you emote, and your heart, you connect to God, be sensitive in your spirit. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And you know, we have to practice it. We have to deal with it because oftentimes we're so busy with the world. We're so busy with the flesh. We need to be, we need to feed the spirit. God desires that you overcome the natural responses to an orphan's heart. Well, we read most of it in the tab, in the table earlier, and there is a response of the orphan's heart. John 14, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. God doesn't want us to remain orphans. That's why we are on a journey from orphanness to sonship. We don't become perfect overnight. We go through progressive means. We go through a journey. We go through a process. Don't short circuit that process. Don't abdicate. Don't abandon it. Don't, uh, don't backslide. But continue in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the natural, when we were rejected, okay, we, all of us may have experienced rejection. We tend to respond by either rebelling or we withdraw. We don't want any part of you because we are rejected. You do it on your own. So in the natural, that's what our flesh would will do, rebel or withdraw. The gospel is not about giving our life to Christ. 
and having a blessed life. You know, when we started out in our Christian life, we come to church, we come to the Lord because we want to be blessed. We give our life to the Lord because we want to be blessed. But it's all about a father. Christianity is all about a father who lost his children, he lost who lost his sons, who lost he lost his daughters, and would do anything to get them back. The father wants the father will do anything to get you back. And that is why you are here tonight in the courts of heaven, session number three, so that God can bring you back to him as we are talking about the spirit of sonship. He wants to love the orphan spirit out of you, if there is any, and introduce you to your true father. Wow. So as we conclude, everything that we are was designed by our heavenly father. Remember, he formed us in our mother's womb. So everything we are was assigned by our heavenly father and that we are his sons now and forever throughout eternity. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And some be saying amen to that. Yes, amen and amen. And so shall we pray. Father, we would like to respond, O oh God, in humility and in meekness to this message and to this teaching tonight. Should there be anything, O oh God, that has transpired between our natural fathers, our biological fathers, and us, if there has been closures of our hearts to our Father, Lord, we want to deal with it tonight. So we ask, O oh God, for forgiveness before you and before our father and mother if they are still alive or whatever they may be tonight we are sorry forgive us for we know that you did not do it uh, intentionally we know that you did not intend to withdraw love from us because first of all you were also victims so we release forgiveness we are really sorry for having closed our hearts to you, father and mother. And we want to make things right. We repent. We would like to relate to you as our father. We would like to be intimate with you, even in the spirit, if not in the, in the flesh. Tonight, restore us, father. Just say the word and it will be done. Store us to our Father as we release forgiveness and ask, O oh God, in re as we repent, that we will be restored. That we will also receive the spirit of sonship as there would be material for the spirit of sonship to work in us, to make us your sons, to make us your daughters, and not just to know about you, to study about you, but to experience you as our real heavenly Father. That we may rest in you that we may walk with you and to be equally yoked in love with you, O oh God. So, Father, just anoint us today as we consecrate our lives to you and to your loving purpose to be a son. We want our hearts to be turned back to you as your heart is turned to us. Make us whole today. Restore us in your most perfect will. Help us, Father. And as we consecrate, sanctify us that we, O oh God, will be an asset to you and to your kingdom and to your greater purposes and that more will transpire in our life as we are able to come to your holy presence, to enter the courts of heaven as a son, as a daughter, to have free entrance to you, God, access to you, and to find favor before you, even tonight and throughout all our days. So Lord, we just put everything in your hands tonight. Thank you 
for this privilege of learning, receiving, and even for the restoration and for the blessing. This we all pray to Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. God bless you and have a powerful um, session um, tonight and even for the coming sessions. Thank you.